Orgasmic enlightenment, where the sexual and spiritual come together. I'm Kimanami, and I'm a holistic sex and relationship coach and a vaginal weightlifter. In this show, we explore all things intimate. I believe that our sexual energy is life force, creative energy, and we can use it to shape our worlds, strengthen our relationships, and self actualize. I blend the most avant-garde information from neuroscience, ancient sexual practices like Tantra and Taoism to renegade wellness modalities to show you how to create gourmet sex in your lives. Come one, come all. When one person wants to grow and the other person, not so much. This is a common issue that comes up in relationships where one person's really invested in their, at least their own evolution and personal growth and development and the other person it might be pretty content to just stay where they are. And this will often come up in the sexual sphere where things hit a standstill and aren't really developing or growing, they feel really stagnant. And so one person typically is more invested in the idea of jumpstarting this part of the relationship and changing it. And the other person may or may not be interested in doing that as well. Typically, that kind of reservation would come from unresolved trauma and stuff that they haven't looked at in their past. And so when they connect in an intimate relationship and those things start to get provoked and triggered and unearthed, either you go forward and decide to confront those things head on to heal them, to transform them, or you want to back off and continue to put those underneath the carpet. And so it really comes down to how you view life and how you view your relationship. And my philosophy is that a relationship is a vessel for personal growth and transformation. So we expect that in a personal relationship, an intimate relationship, that our most deep-seated issues, traumas, unresolved stuff gets triggered and comes up to the surface in this beautiful container for it to be illuminated and looked at with our partner in this beautiful light of love and passion and desire for each other. And we can unearth those things, bring them up and then heal them together. Or, you know, we can all do our individual work, but we're also doing this stuff together. So, This is what I find the most profound. It's one of my biggest messages in my work is that this really is the true function of relationships to hold the growth of the individuals. So your growth, my growth, and the growth of the relationship itself, that there's three entities that we're constantly looking at and seeing how can we better grow them, develop them, take them to the highest level possible. So some people look at their relationships as having this capacity, but I'd say that most people don't. And they might look at other parts of their lives as having this ability to grow and evolve, like maybe their health and their well-being, or of course, most people look at their careers as a place where they can grow and develop. So they definitely adhere to the concept that they go get some education or training in a particular area, and then they go out into the world, they do this work, and they continue to get training and workshops and seminars and mentorships and keep abreast of latest developments in their industry. Most people accept that as something they would have to do to really stay on top of their game. People don't tend to apply the same concept to an intimate relationship. And that's partly all connected to this whole repression around sexuality and intimacy where nobody really gets taught how to do relationships and certainly no one's getting any kind of good sex education out there. And So, of course, like imagine if you go buy a new plant from the plant store and you bring it home and you sit it in the corner of your room and at first you're all excited about the plant and so you give it great sunlight and you buy the best fertilizer and you water it exactly when you're supposed to water it to take 
perfect care of it and it flourishes and then you get a bit bored you've got other things going on and other priorities in your life and so you just kind of neglect the plant and you forget about it and you're like you know what the plant's taking up space over there I'm going to put it in the corner over here it's still an all right plant but like you know I've got other stuff that I just got this new chair let's put the chair over there and the plant starts to wither and die of neglect and of course the exact same thing happens to our relationships they don't die a natural death they die a neglect death where people have been ignoring them and not putting positive energy and intention into them and not using them as the vessels for growth that they were intended to be. So I see intimate relationships as one of the most powerful personal growth tools that there are out there. But they have to have the ingredient of gourmet sex, so passionate sex. So not just a buddy relationship. I talked about this last week in the podcast, are you lovers or are you roommates? And if you're just roommates, you're not tapping into the true potential of your relationship. So you can be good partners, like make a good couple in a lot of like administrative ways. But if you're not tearing each other's clothes off and fucking the demons out of each other, you're not really justifying the relationship and using it to its true potential. So I live by the philosophy grow or die, meaning that if you're not growing, you're dying. Nothing in nature remains in stasis. That's an illusion. And we're either going forward and learning and developing and hitting new heights in everything we do, or we're going backwards. So nothing just stays stagnant. You know, the stagnancy eventually turns into more rot and decay and destruction. And people often don't see that and they certainly don't connect the two things together. So I see personal relationships, your intimate sexual relationship as this incredible venue for you to really self-actualize. And so, as I said, we want and expect that your deepest wounds will get triggered. So often our family of origin wounds, this is where they're going to come up, is in our most vulnerable intimate relationships. And this is good. We want this to happen. But it's only really good if both people have an understanding that this is what is supposed to happen And we're both committed to working through these things as they come up. Because if you don't look at the relationship that way, you're going to see these things as annoyances or, oh, this person has a lot of baggage. Or you'll just keep going in circles and circles around the same issues and never be able to break out of these patterns. And you'll carry these patterns from relationship to relationship because they never actually get healed. So let's say you are in this position where you realize that you want to grow, you want to develop, and it's really hard to do that if you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't. And I'm all for the idea that we have our own individual paths and lives, but as you're so intimately connected with somebody, after a while, if you keep growing and evolving and moving forward and your partner doesn't, you're going to leave them behind. And people are free to choose what they want to do. You can invite them to come with you, and if they don't want to come, they don't want to come. But let's say that you are in love with this person, and so you have have an attachment and a vested interest to them coming and you know this is where you have to then this is what this podcast is really all about so what do you do so first off to say that if you've been in a relationship where your shared value was stagnation and I'm not being extremist here like people knowingly or not commit to stagnation like let's keep the same the same we've got a don't ask don't tell policy in the relationship we're totally committed to the idea of white lies to not hurt each other's feelings you know like it's a commitment that they have so if you entered your relationship under those pretenses then you're changing the status quo you're changing the rules of the game that you both agreed on when you entered into there. So your partner may or may not want to follow you along on your new adventure, right? Like on this new direction that you've decided because you changed the way that things were or want to change them from what you entered. So this is where you need to initiate a conversation about like, like, this is what you've discovered. This is what you've learned. Even if like people say, introduce my work into the conversation of look, you know, there's nothing wrong with our sex life because people often feel like their partner will be threatened to hear that. But did you know that women can have cervical orgasms? And this crazy lady, Kim and Ami, says that all women can. She guarantees it. And she says that guys, like every guy can fuck like Sting. And every woman can shoot ejaculate across the room. And every guy can like have sex for hours and hours and have multiple orgasms and full body orgasms. And then they'll be like, huh, 
really? <laughs> like, so you're not saying, hey, you're not so great in bed, but this is what's actually possible. So that's part of the framework, isn't, you know, and there, but, and truly, there might be things that, problems that are there that really do need to get fixed, but you can frame the conversation in this light of look at all the incredible things that there are out there that we, oh, I didn't even have any idea. So you can start from there. And most people, if, unless they've had, intense sexual trauma will be intrigued because wow why wouldn't that sound amazing and if they don't think it sounds amazing it's because they've got a lot of deep-seated trauma that they haven't looked at and it, you know obviously we've got extremely high statistics around incidents of sexual assault sexual abuse in our culture and these are only the reported numbers and so most people are carrying around some kind of wounding and trauma around sexuality so stuff builds up in the relationship if you do not clear it out and do the work. So in a relationship where the tacit agreement is don't ask, don't tell, tell white lies, is that you're going to have this eventual pile up of stuff that does not get dealt with. And, you know, people are afraid of confrontation. They want to keep the peace. They want to, you know, shovel things under the rug instead of telling the truth. But this takes a toll. You end up with this mountain of unresolved stuff that piles up and this turns into a wall which translates into not feeling connected and then that translates into not wanting to have sex and then this will show up as somebody's premature ejaculation or their erectile dysfunction or their low libido or the woman's inability to lubricate and because western medicine is so fucking dumb and people are conditioned to think that these things are so totally unrelated to the state of relationship people don't connect them they don't think there's any relationship between what's happening their symptoms that are coming up for them and these are just the sexual ones not to mention all the other life symptoms like say depression or weight gain or really struggling in your career or financially my view is that these things are the direct barometer of stagnancy in our relationship. So because sexual energy is so powerful, this is, I always say, our life force energy, if it's being suppressed, it takes a massive, massive toll, not just on the relationship, but on you as an individual and your health. Eventually, they become these physical manifestations of the symptoms of stagnation. So the first thing to do is have a conversation and express what you've discovered, what you are learning about, and invite them. Invite them, if you don't already have that dynamic, invite it, right? Like, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to look at our relationship as this place of growth and evolution are you interested in that? Like, look at all the possibilities out there for this. And then send them to me. Send them to some of my videos. I've got tons of free content out here in my podcast, my YouTube channel, tons of old blog posts. You can send them to, over to any of this stuff. I have a bunch of video series on my website under sexual savant salons for couples, women, vaginas, <laughs> sexy mamas, and for men. So people can sign up for any of those to get a deeper sense of what I'm talking about and what's really possible. That's one of my favorite things in this work is showing people what's possible and then obviously showing them how to get there. So let's say that, okay, best case scenario is the partner is, wow, that sounds amazing. Sign me up. <laughs> like you really want to learn more about the best kind of blowjobs you can give. I totally support that. Oh, we're fantastic. If they don't come, then the, you, you give them the most gentle, loving invitation that you can. So I said, instead of focusing on what's wrong, and, and sometimes you have to because things have gotten so bad that you have to express that. So you start out with a gentle invitation of this is what could happen. These are the possibilities for us. And if they don't hear that, then you might go deeper into how you are being affected by the lack of growth in the relationship and try to keep it really on you. Try not to blame them. Try not to put it on them, but talk about how you feel and the effect it's having on you. Then, if they still don't bite and they're not interested, then I suggest that you pull all of the focus and the attention away from them, okay? So you bring all of the attention back to you, and you're going to focus on your growth and your development and your healing. So this piece is really important. You need to energetically, not just 
you know, stop asking them and then feel resentful and irritated and punish them, you know, secretly. No, you need to totally detach and withdraw that invitation, let go of the fact that they said no, whatever, and come back to yourself. And now you're going to throw yourself into therapy, healing modalities, coaching, working on yourself, whatever you can do. Like if you found that you actually have trauma that hasn't been resolved, I talk a lot in my salons about different ways to clear trauma from a neural pathway perspective, a really deep way to erase that in your system. And even the study of sexual energy, like just familiarizing yourself, getting to know, reconnect with your sexual energy is a huge quantum leap in your growth and development. So whatever that looks like for you, that you start doing your own internal work. If you've identified that there's places where you're holding pain, you've got family of origin issues, you've got, you know, stuff that you've happened that's happened in your whatever, 20s, 30s, 40s, anything that's you could that you identify and maybe you don't identify it as that. Maybe all you've got is the knowledge that you've got patterns that you keep repeating in relationship that are sabotaging your relationship and keep happening over and over again. That's fine. That's enough to start with. And then bring that to somebody and, you know, initiate the process of doing some work. So then something like this will happen, like you start to clear your own trauma and blockages. So the things that have been imprinted upon you and your nervous system, when you start to collapse those neural pathways in yourself, this means that you won't start you won't continue to act in the same ways. Those patterns that kept haunting you for years, they will fall away and you won't be manifesting the same kinds of situations into your space and your life. And you'll be reacting differently to your intimate partner. So we, there's a whole philosophy that we attract people who actually are meant to trigger us, that they're holding energetic imprints that are very similar to ones that we were either hurt by or had trauma around in our family of origin or beyond. And we do that because on an unconscious level, we actually want to clear them. We want to be able to heal and to grow. And so we bring people to us who have a similar energy pattern that will help us to do this. So what you often notice then is that things that used to trigger you about your partner, suddenly they just roll off your back. Like you just kind of take it into stride and you can deal with it. And at the same time, whatever you notice about your partner that you're getting triggered by, write it down, make a list, and then take it into contemplation and or to your counselor or therapist or wherever you've decided to go. And you can ask your higher self for guidance on what this is and how you can best heal it. So as you grow and you shift and you transform, you'll have more clarity on what you want and you'll have the confidence to take action. So whether that's getting more clear about your needs and expressing them to your partner and requesting what you want, whether that's setting boundaries in the relationship or doing things that you didn't do before or not doing things that you used to do, or maybe it's even leaving. But at this point, you don't have to make the decision. You just have to keep doing enough work until you get that level of healing and clarity and shift where you've actually shifted to another level within yourself. So in doing this work, the next thing that happens is your partner is then going to start to sense that there's something different in you and they might not be able to put their finger on it exactly, but maybe a way that you were pressuring them or nagging them or resenting them or belittling them, that's toned down or even gone and they've suddenly got more space they've got more breathing room so the same puzzle pieces of trauma and dysfunction that were once there don't lock together in the same way anymore and so this shifts the entire dynamic in the relationship so you will interact with each other in a new way and you will get triggered much less because now you've cleared your own stuff so the partner will feel the shift and typically they are intrigued now they're a little more interested and like, what do you got going on over there? It's like when people do personal work or they go to the gym or, you know, they have a whole new wellness routine and people are like, what are you doing? Like, you look so different. You feel different. You look different. Like, what are you doing? They're curious because they can feel it and it feels good. And that's what happens with the partner generally is that they feel that something's different. So now they're like a little more interested in like, what do you got going on over there? Because <laughs> like, they're, 
they're feeling more attracted even to you because you're more whole, you're more healed, and you're not acting out in as much of a danger, um, a wounded place that you were before. Plus, you've stopped pointing the finger at them as the source of your ills, and you've taken full responsibility for your healing and your wellness. The pressure and the attacks are off of them. So now they can let down their guard again, and they can assess what's really going on. And so if it feels good, as I said, they may draw closer, and then they may start to be more intrigued and start to ask you about what you've been up to. But leaving this space is quite important, right, for them to just get a breather, catch their breath from whatever energy you've been throwing on to them, and then for them to actually perceive and feel some kind of difference in you. So that's the part that we're really waiting for. And we're not waiting for it in the sense like, oh, we can't go forward until this happens, or when is this going to happen? You have to release all attachment of it even happening. I'm just telling you what typically happens, but you're doing this for your own good and your own investment in yourself, and ultimately the relationship, but it's not about waiting for the moment they come running. That's not the focus. So, all right, next stage would be that, you know, maybe nothing changes in them, but everything is changed in you. So maybe they don't really feel affected by what you've done. They seem to be still stewing in a lot of their own stuff and not really reacting to you or your change or they've still got walls up like that's really what it is they've built up walls over the years either through being in relationship together or their own past trauma or a combination of both and they're still locked in so here then again you would be less affected by what they do or they don't do you are more interested in what you need and what makes you feel good and so you're less triggered in the relationship you're not blaming them for things that might even be your wounding that you've just projected on them and the whole dynamic shifts and this might mean that you end up leaving the relationship and so be it but at this stage you would have the clarity so as and you know now you would have if you've done enough work you've built this up up and who the, I don't exactly know how long this could take. It could take months for you, but probably months, like a good, serious, committed therapy, I'd say three to six, maybe. And during this time period, would, you would actually say to yourself, look, I'm taking this time out of three to six months. I'm not going to be thinking, thinking, do I stay in the relationship? What do I do? How can I, you know, don't even go there. Focus a thousand percent on you. So at this point, then you feel like you've done your three to six months, then presumably you'll have more clarity about what you actually want and the decision that you'll make. Do you want to stay in this relationship? If obviously, if they've started to become intrigued and interested, and maybe they've started to join you on this path, like slowly but surely, or sometimes they dive right in. If they've done absolutely nothing and there's still no shift, then you get to make the decision, right? Like, is there still more work for you to do? Do you have now clarity? I really trust the process that when you commit yourself to this level of deep personal work, you'll know. You'll know what to do once you go through to the other side of that. So if you leave, you leave. And I guess what I also want to say here is that Don't be afraid of ending relationships because sometimes they do actually need to die before they can come back reborn. Sometimes you actually need that physical space and the true you know, burning to the ashes of a relationship. And it doesn't maybe mean you'll be, you know, separated forever. But once you know, okay, I've hit a limit where I'm going to walk away from this now because it doesn't feel good for my self-worth. I'm not being valued and honored and I'm losing myself. I'm losing the true, authentic, good parts of me by staying in this situation. You make the decision to leave. And at that point, that can often spur people into action where they're like oh okay and then that's enough of a shock to their system where they often come back to be like all right so and especially when you're doing it from such a very genuine achieved place achieved meaning you worked at this you earned this you earned this wisdom and this insight and this spiritual strength to make your decision and that people have a truth barometer we all have dividing rods within us and when we feel the truth and somebody around us and sometimes it takes that level of shock to the system to penetrate through our walls to get there that wakes wakes us up to be like oh okay so now or never what's my decision you know and then they may come back towards you and in that act of you leaving and you know whatever that looks like 
then you can rebuild, right? Like if the person comes as a malleable, committed force willing to do the work on the relationship, then you get to decide, all right, do I want to pursue now with this person? How genuine are they? Do we need to take some time apart for them to collect themselves or do some work to really prove that they're serious about it? Or, you know, it depends where you are on the scale, how you want to play that. But I, you know, that's something that I, again, I want to repeat, like, don't be afraid to make that decision. A friend of mine years ago, her mom used to say to her, what's meant for you won't pass by you. And I really love that as a sense of having the faith that if this isn't the right person for you, so be it. And if it is the right person, things will work out, you know, in the way that as long as we're always being true to ourselves, like that's the thing that I find has to be there is there can be so much distortion when you're living in a, a relationship full of lies or white lies or don't don't ask, don't tell. You distort everything in the relationship. But if you are committed to a path of honesty and deep communication in the relationship, then you can figure things out. And then the truth itself becomes, becomes something to put your faith into that it will show you the right direction to go in. So that's obviously like, you know, diverging the <laughs> at the crossroads of the direction that you could possibly go. And then the best case scenario is that the partner some at some point during this process becomes inspired and they want what you've got or they want what they want that to be applied to the relationship. You know, they see the positive shifts and changes in you and it looks good. They're attracted. They feel good. They see a new possibility, like a new chrysalis emerging of the relationship like what that could look like and feel like. And then you can go forward as having this mutual agreement and commitment to use the relationship as a vessel for transformation and growth, which means that it is this space where you can bring all of your stuff in and you don't get threatened by it. You try not to get so triggered by it because now you're both in on the game. You're both consciously looking at the things or trying to consciously look at. A lot of our stuff that comes up is unconscious, right? It's stuff that's been programmed, conditioned, trauma that's been wired into us. And so we can have reactions that are totally uncontrolled and unconscious. And so as we bond together and agree to fight this fight together, then we're on the same team. Right? So when somebody has an episode that is unconscious and that comes out into the space, we can try to work on it as allies rather than as adversaries. And that's the ultimate place that we want to be. And of course, no one's perfect. No relationship is perfect. We sometimes all of us can get triggered and go beyond that conscious place. But the faster that we recover and we know that this is our agreement, this is what we're here to do, is to look at these things, to let all of our stuff come out from our deepest places and to look at it together and to hold it in the space together. And again, I'll come back to this idea that the most powerful tool that you have with each other is a passionate sexual love connection so this isn't again like i said just buddies or whatever like you have to have that deep level of sexual love and that will help you to transform your stuff so much faster you will burn through it like like bionic phoenixes like because you've got this wild life-giving life-changing transformational tool at your fingertips literally at your genitals at your fingertips that you can use with each other and in my work in my salons I talk a lot about how couples can consciously use their sexual energy as a way to burn through their stuff even faster right so they consciously learn how to exchange their energy and move their energy in ways to process and transform and to up level at the speed of light. And that's where we want to be. That's what we want to be doing is have this totally clear and open emotional channel and this very powerful and conscious sexual channel to reconcile all of our stuff and to keep evolving and growing. And the more that you do this, it so deepens your bond. When you bring stuff to the surface and then you process it together and you move through it, that's the stuff that really cements your bond. You really get to know the deepest levels of your partner and you share the deepest levels of yourself and you get cherished and you get witnessed and you get held and you get loved through it. And there is no greater healing medicine than that experience to really bring all pieces of you, your deepest parts, your most scared parts, terrified, shameful even parts, and your most vulnerable parts on all of this rawness and bring it out and then be loved for it and be supported through the process of integrating and evolving together. 
So today we have a fantastic all-star. She's a woman who was in one of my, I think it was my very first well-fucked woman salon back in the day. And one of the things that I love about her, you know, in healing professions, any kind of profession, like from doctors to psychologists, one of the things that you most love in your clients is their compliance, meaning the best students slash patients slash clients will do what you fucking tell them to do. <laughs> like so, so you give them these instructions, you give them this home play, and some people will run with it. And other people, it's like pulling teeth. Like they're like, oh no, I didn't do that. I didn't do this. And you're like, well, why are you paying me money to help you when you're not even going to do the work? Like people who go to a naturopath and the naturopath gives them all kinds of dietary suggestions and they're like, no, no, no. Well, why are you paying money to just come in? It's like you just want someone to mom me you for a while anyway so the opposite is true with this woman she just took everything and ran with it just you know the most like fiercest homework doer home play doer and just had phenomenal results so she's one of my favorite all-time well-fucked all-stars welcome well-fucked all-stars Hi, Marianne. How's it going? It's going great. How are you doing? Fantastic. So we want to hear all about your experiences with you being in a position in a relationship where you want to grow and evolve and you feel like your partner isn't at the same pace. And so how did you work through that in your relationship? What did that look like for you? Yeah, so a lot of the things that I ended up approaching my partner with um, there was resistance and there was like, yeah, it sounds good. I don't have time for it, that kind of thing. But when we, I remember when I discovered your work, um, and I sort of read through every blog post and I was standing there on the kitchen counter, just reading stuff out to him and his, his sort of just whole body lit up and he's like, wow, is that really even possible? How, how does one do those things that you were referring to about, you know, really growing sexually and being able to have this deep relationship and connection and intimacy with your partner. And um, I remember noticing that he totally lit up. So when, you know, when I, I remember I contacted you right after that and then, you know, signed up and coached with you and signed up for all your programs. <laughs> and um, what came out of that was just his you know, he kind of really woke up to um, the anything sexually that I was exploring or thinking about doing. He was so excited about it. But that then connected. I, what I loved about your work was, and loves still, is how you connected back to, you know, the deeper places within ourselves, the evolution and the growth. And he was so much better able to receive it through there than any of the other ways that I brought to him. So I was like, you know what? I don't care how you come to it. Just <laughs> <laughs> through blowjobs or through <laughs> sit-ups. Take your pick. Right. Or, oh, right. Exactly. Or through just watching me become more sensual and sexual and open. And, you know, because one of the main reasons that I'd come to work with you was because I wanted to heal um, old sexual trauma and abuse and how that was it wasn't like I'd done a lot of work on it already but I noticed that there were threads of it you know showing up in mm -hmm. my marriage and in my in my intimate times with my partner and so I really wanted to work on that and what you showed me was not just that how where I didn't want to be but also just how limitless it is to what's the upper limit there isn't an upper limit on it right so I got to explore that and how amazing that was. And and that really, I think witnessing me open up in that way really lit a light, light within him. And then he was so much more open to any other thing spiritually that I suggested or growth-wise that I suggested. And so it was just this beautiful evolution, but he came to it through the sexual, sensual practices. Sometimes I think for men that it's that 
full sensual expression of the woman that when the woman really opens up and gives herself to him it activates something in him where his defenses his resistance melts away and then he becomes much more accommodating to whatever else right like much more open to other suggestions where before i feel like when they feel this sort of block somehow in the sexuality and they feel like maybe they're being held at bay in some way whether that's conscious or unconscious that they're not then as participating and then when you remove that they become much more willing exactly exactly i really think that there's there's so much truth in that because um that was my experience. I think that there was, you know, people, you know, we joke with each other that it was just the sex part that he lit up to and we kind of joke about it, but you're right because I really feel that when a woman does fully open up into herself, her sexuality, her sensuality, you know, and her ability to be vulnerable, um, that, changes a man completely and it's a real to witness that for a man to fully witness that in a woman he's with is it changes him as a woman changes she has so much power um to shift him and that's really what i found and have carried i think i met you seven years ago we were saying mm -hmm. i think seven years and it's been that long. It's just been, it hasn't stopped evolving, which is so incredible. So I feel like when I've seen that as well, it's like this automatic innate reaction that a man has. Like when the woman really opens that way, something in him just innately responds and feels so much more you know, like melted within himself and open within himself to really receive her and look after her and accommodate her like he's there, like his masculine gets activated. When her feminine gets truly owned and inhabited through that deep surrender in sex, his masculine gets activated in a crazy powerful way. Crazy powerful is right. Mm. They, you know, they, that, that thing that women always crave, like for their man, like, hold them and and you know you always say like you know if I if I fall will you catch me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt that so much one of the one of the things you know in the bedroom that we were really that I didn't even know was something that was so within him to give um, is pleasuring me I mean he is all about that and well, so was he not, like that before, or were you not allowing it, or what's the deal there? I was allowing it. <laughs> <laughs> I was allowing it. So I never got to see that because I was always holding back um, in some way. And then when that changed and I wasn't holding back anymore, it was unreal how he he would just, any chunks he got, like he would, wanted to help me feel good, help me experience pleasure and willing to explore, you know, the G spot orgasms and the cervical orgasms and the, you know, all of it. And I discovered parts of myself that I didn't even know existed only because he was so willing to be there with no resistance whatsoever. Again, so would you attribute his willingness to your opening? Or was there anything else that you would say factored into that, what seems like a pretty unbridled openness and willingness from, on his part as well? Yeah, I think me opening up, um, it, you know, drew that out of him too. It just, it, it was me opening up. There was nothing else that changed at that time in our lives. So prior to the sexual work, like it sounds like you were trying to do things like maybe get him because I know that you lead a very holistic lifestyle. So you might have been inviting him into like meditation or health practices or whatever. I'm sure some of that just filters through in your family life. It just has to bleed over. But it sounds right. like he was less interested. And then when you touched on this piece and invited him, hit him into this arena, that was the catalyst that just opened everything up. It really, really did. And yes, I did invite him into um, many different um, 
spaces that I felt were growth spaces for me. And I invited him because I felt we should grow together. But I think he saw that as me trying to fix him mm-hmm. um, and that there was a problem. And maybe maybe I did come across like that. I mean, it's so long ago now, it's even hard for me to remember. Um, but I'm pretty sure I may have come across like that in this way. But when I stepped into the, the sexual work um, that I was doing just in healing myself, and that opening up this beautiful, magnetic, powerful, feminine within myself, he was so like a moth to a flame. It's like, okay, what did you say? <laughs> you know, it was truly, I witnessed magic in those moments um, that I didn't even think were possible, Kim, ever. So after that, did he become like, did he sort of like, oh yeah, let's go meditate together? Like, how did you see that filter out then into other parts of your life, that openness? Yeah. Yeah, it did filter out. He did, he did, he was more willing to meditate. He was more willing to um, hear about, like I was working, I was doing a program with energy work and um, he was more willing to hear about what I was really doing and how he was willing to hear about triggers and what they are and how we can own them and how we can shift as a result of them and like, you know, the work around, I mean, because look, your work, while well, it's so much focused on the physical aspects of sex, but it so much affects everything not in the non-physical. And so when we did your first program, and I say we because even though it was well-fucked woman, um, he did it with me. Um, and he watched all the videos and, you know, some of the practices about deepening intimacy, one we still use today is, you know, not to let anything get muddy on that glass, right? Mm. The pain between us and that honesty. So, you know, we'll come to each other and say, okay, it feels a little muddy right now. So what are we not sharing? Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah. What are we not, what are we holding back? And that metaphor has always stuck with us. And we, we love coming back to that because it's just so visually clear, you know, what's going on there. And so, and it's not that we're not being honest with each other. It's sort of just, you know, not having sometimes, it's like a benchmark for us. You know, are we really, is the glass really clear right now or is there mud on the glass? So what are we not sharing? Where have we held back consciously or unconsciously? Mm -hmm. Or Mm -hmm. where could we explore something deeper um, where could we, you know, spend more time in physical intimacy? Where do we need, you know, so it's, it's, it allows us, um, and I think the other thing that we really carry till today is like, how was your emotional day today? You know, like asking each other that question, not just how was your day, but so how do you end up answering that question? Because it's a very good distinction, right? Like not just narrating, and then I went for lunch here with my friend, and then this happened at work. Like how do you separate that layer? And what does the conversation so, look like then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's, so it, it's very powerful for us. So how, we, how it goes is um, I'm feeling, we always start with a feeling, and we've worked a lot on the difference between I feel that, or I believe that, or I think that, versus what I'm actually feeling and using a feeling word, an emotion to describe the feeling. Mm -hmm. So, um, because I think that, or I feel that is more of a belief rather than your feeling about something. Mm -hmm. So, um, we go into, now he'll say, you know, I'm really frustrated um, about, or I'm fr- I was frustrated when this happened in my day in the morning at work. And then I, cause we both work from home. And so, you know, I was frustrated in my morning about this. And then, you know, I had a really nice break at lunch and I was able to relax a little bit and let go of that. And then the afternoon felt a little bit tense because I had all these things to get done. And then, you know, or, or it, it could look like, Oh my God, I was so frustrated this morning. Um, uh, with our argument that we had in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. 
and I carried that throughout the day. So it could be any any of those areas, and for myself too, um, you know, my emotions that come up, like either a sadness or anger, or I'm really angry right now. Um, and so being able to express that has been so incredibly liberating because now we don't necessarily go through our day. It could, and sometimes it's even carrying an emotion that you could be having for a few days, really, you know, and allowing that to surface. Or sometimes it's not even of that day. It could stem from like the weekend or two weeks ago and you didn't connect it and then you're having the space to really share what you think and or what you feel and you can go back and be like, you know what, I think the genesis of this was, actually this started like two weeks ago when I was going through whatever, like I'm, I'm struggling with, um, you know, sleep because the kids woke me up early and I was just so f frustrated that day because I had a headache and I couldn't get my, my nap in the afternoon because we had so much going on. You know, it sort of comes, it can, it can really help us connect all these pieces of life. Um, it's just, to us, that's our like go to conversation. Um, and it and I wouldn't have had him ever open up to that if it hadn't been, you know, me exploring self pleasuring or me exploring or him wanting to pleasure me and me being okay with that. So there's such a powerful connection that happens. Some I think for maybe some people the conversation could come first, for us the physical came first. Right. Yeah. Well, I love that then you've carried on because I talked earlier in this episode about how we're you know looking to have a constant evolution in the relationship. So there's relationships that are committed to stagnation, which is most relationships, and then relationships where both people are committed to growth and evolution. And so the way that we keep that in motion is like one of the techniques that you described that I talk about in my work is having this open forum for communication. And so I use a metaphor of having a pane of glass between two people. And whenever you're holding back or you're not telling the truth or you outright lie, then you put a splotch of mud up on that glass. And then the more mud that gets splattered on the glass, it creates an actual wall. You've built a wall between the two people. And so it's a constant effort to keep sure that the glass is clean and whatever you, and you can start to feel that. Like the way I like the way you described it, it's like a palpable feeling like, okay, we don't know what's there exactly, but something's there. There feels like there's some kind of rift or distance between us. Let's both try to figure out what that is. Yeah, exactly. And the more you tune into it, the easier it becomes to feel that there is something there because then you can tell the difference between when it's really clear and when it's not. Well, when it's really clear, that also leads to that really juicy, connected, blissful, and passionate. Like, that's when libidos are high. Like, that's, I think, another connection people don't make, is that, like, when the glass is clear, when you feel really bonded and close like that, that's when you have the most desire for each other. And so it's in everyone's best interest to keep that glass clean and keep that energy field open, and then you naturally just want to be close physically with each other. 100 percent right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean there's it's such a powerful exploration between you know couples between partners um because when and i honestly i feel like so many people don't have the experience of that because you know to be radically honest with someone it takes a certain level of vulnerability you know it's sort of like the chicken and the egg like which comes first do you be that vulnerable and then like <laughs> hope that you, they'll catch you and they'll be there for you and they've got your back or do you you know so I think so many people get caught up in the I'd like to do that but I'm not sure if I can I'm not sure if my partner will be on board and to some degree you got to just take a risk and do it because that act of vulnerability or showing up being radically honest, it that courage within you is infectious, you know, and it, it, it changes other people and they're witnessing of it. So 
I know it, it has taken both of us courage. I know it sounds easy, but um, there were definitely moments where I'm like, do I really want to share that with him? Like, I don't want him to get pissed. I don't want him to like get mad at me and like walk away and then we're not talking again. And, and so there's all those like glitches we feel inside and, and knowing that we have our sexual relationship to fall back upon, um, because that really was a thing for us. Um, we really had that really powerfully. Um, we knew that we could go there and it would clear things for us and come back to it over and over, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how it works for others, but I know that when I work with people and women, there's a big block there for many women in trusting, intimate, being intimate. I think for women anyway, I think the emotional pieces are really important. Um, and that place of vulnerability that they have a hard time going to is also really important. I mean, it's our greatest strength is our vulnerability, in my opinion. Um, so, I well, agree. Of the time, that that's yeah. the, the the building the fertile ground from which everything else springs out. And that's the key ingredient to gourmet sex. When I make the distinction between junk food sex and gourmet sex, the difference is vulnerability and openness and pulling down your barriers and really being raw. And you can actually learn to live in that place. And that's, I think, one of my greatest uh, observations through having cataclysmic sex was when it brought me to that totally raw, exposed place and then how incredibly powerful I felt in that vulnerability and how it actually changed me as a person and changed my life and changed everything about how I interacted out in the world with that kind of energy as an aura around me. Oh, yeah. I that's, Those words are so powerful because, you know, the other thing that drew me to your work so much was because I have a background in um, teaching about natural birth and um, when I read what you said about vulnerability and I had already had um, two births by the time I met you and I had really beautiful births I had pain-free births event-free births quick births and um, I really knew that I had been able to bring that to the space of birth but I really had not been able to bring it to the space of my sexual life with my partner hmm. and you made me see how similar they were and that if I could do it there I could do it in with him too like if I could do it with birth and um, realizing actually that the most vulnerable I had ever been in my entire life was when I was giving birth and um, I went on to have another child whose pregnancy and birth were probably the most ecstatic experiences of my life um, and the birth of my uh, third child was truly ecstatic um, and it just uh, it just made me realize that because I'd done so much work with being vulnerable by the time I had um, my third that the ability to open up was so much greater and I'd experienced cervical orgasm before that and then when I had my third child I experienced it again and it was just this incredible beautiful high that you know you talk about the hormone oxytocin and we do too and it's just sort of like that experience and having my partner with me in the birth pool together like bringing this child forth together it's like not just me doing it but that experience is one that I think I'll never forget and I think it your work and me engaging with all of that um, help really set the the ground for having that kind of birth experience as well you're such a beautiful 
example of how when you hit that place in yourself and in your relationship, it then becomes this energy and extra power becomes infused into every other part of your life. Everything else gets up leveled. So you already achieved a very powerful birth experiences. It sounds like very unlike what most women have. And then with that added piece of deepening that vulnerability and that openness and these higher levels of orgasms, you even get to a more magnificent place in that birth. Yeah, it's, it's a feeling that if you've not experienced it, it's really hard to understand through words and description because you're, you're not here. <laughs> you're very much in a different um, realm of consciousness um, and it's like this African proverb that they say right when you're giving birth it's like the mother reaches all the way out into the stars and brings forth her baby hmm. so that's the closest that I think I can describe that with you go somewhere else completely and that's and then knowing that through intimate experiences and intimacy and having this gourmet sex experience with your partner that you can achieve that same it's not exactly the same but it comes close um uh that level of vulnerability and an ecstasy it's there's nothing quite like it amazing so bringing it back to, let's say yeah. we're back to a couple who one person is more engaged with and passionate about growing and the other person isn't so much like, what advice would you give couples in that situation based on your experience? I would say that um, if you are the one who wants to grow and evolve more and your partner is not quite there yet, just do what you have to do for you. Because when you do that, um, the people around you change. So either they come along with you or they're no longer want to be in your orbit. So either way, if you're focusing on your growth and doing the thing that's supporting you the best way and, and helping you evolve and you grow, then you do that. And if they're the right person for you or they're meant to be around you, then they will grow with you. Awesome. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying earlier, is that either way, it's win-win. If you do the work on yourself, either way, you'll know what to do. Either the relationship transforms or you have the clarity about stepping away from it. Exactly. And, yeah. and it is a win-win. You grow. And you, you, I mean, I don't think anyone that I've met who's evolved and grown has ever said, I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> <laughs> what a mistake all those years of working on myself yeah what a way could have been at the like, bar right <laughs> no one no one i have ever worked with i have ever known um has said that so it is definitely a, you win if you work on yourself you always win love it all right well, let's end it on that note thank you so much thank you it was a pleasure Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, subscribe and also leave a review and send someone else the gift of a healthy libido and an off the charts love life by sharing this episode with them. We'll be back next week. And in the meantime, many happy orgasms.